Leeds, 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 what is happening? Well, this is the third episode of the Working Hours podcast. This is another anonymous guest, as I hinted at. Certain, if not most, episodes will keep the guest and their employers redacted to protect both the guests and their employers. So unless the guest is already known or is self-employed or promoting a workplace, they will not be identified. Where I want to get to with these is to start titling or at least tagging these anonymous episodes with job titles or professions. The idea being to maybe help people considering certain careers, learn what they might be getting themselves into and or how they might get into it. I hope you enjoy episode three and I will be back at the end. What did you want to be when you grew up? Wow, big question. I don't know, but it was going to be something... I didn't know, Mm. but I did know I wanted to be something like a lawyer or a doctor or a lecturer or a professor or... A profession? Yeah. So it was always like, yeah, I'm going to do something that's a profession. Yeah, absolutely, and meaningful. So, and what do you do now? (laughs) Uh, Work for... Okay, so you're in a um, sort of vocational sector. Sure, yeah. Yeah. How's that? Um, It's good. It's the admin side. Yeah. We get paid far too much money. Yeah. Considering the amount of money that people on the wards and in the hospitals get paid. Yeah. It's significantly more. Mm. It's far less stressful, I'm sure. Mm. Even at times when we're really busy, it's not life or death busy. Yeah. So if we miss a deadline, eh. You know, you might get a couple of scowls and a... But if you're in a hospital and there's a crisis, it's totally different. Yeah. Totally different. So, yeah, I think we get far too much money. I do really like the difference between where I am now and when I was working in a hospital doing admin. Mm -hmm. Because the staff I was working with at the hospital... Mm -hmm were the ones who would come in and talk about the soaps from last night or what was in this week's glossy magazine and Mm. it just leaves me utterly cold. Yeah. And then when I moved where you have to be a graduate for a start so there's a certain level of education Mm -hmm. that's expected of you and you can talk about books that you really like and theories about things and people don't glaze, people actually join in and recommend things and... You get some really lively discussions going on. Yeah. And I love that. And I think that was part of wanting to do something that was professional, I yeah. guess, to be around people who are, well, yeah, intellectual, I guess, to a certain extent. People that are being educated. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. Which doesn't necessarily have to be elitist. That's no, just like people no. that education does expose you to things. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> but then you don't need the education if you have that inquiring mind because yeah. you self educate. But I think that, again, that's not something that is innate that has to come from somewhere that has to be guess, an influence yeah okay? yeah yeah there has to be an influence for sure there has to be sure. someone within your sphere when you're younger that is self-educated or that yes. is interested in educating themselves and then educating you yeah yeah and i definitely had that yeah yeah because i think the love of learning has to be is something that has to be developed yes it is yeah. it is and it isn't in there i absolutely agree yeah um so, how long have you been doing this for now? Um, just coming up to seven years. Okay. Um, and have you always worked in a sort of admin, admin environment? No. No. I had 20 years in IT. Mm-hmm. So, that was very, very different. Mm. And it's a highly volatile market even now. Uh, but it's been through some really difficult times. So, after my third redundancy... Mm. I'd met my now husband and he was traveling a lot and I had the opportunity to go with him. So I decided to temp for a while. Mm -hmm. I had a redundancy package and I temped and ended up in a hospital. And it's one of those areas where you need to be able to grasp things quickly and you need to be able to translate things, I guess. So when you're doing things like typing up letters that doctors have dictated, you need to know the procedures and you need to know the medications and you need to know what the patient is suffering with or Mm -hmm. from. So 
it was very, very different, obviously, to IT. But having placed me within the NHS, everything I got after that was NHS because, as I'm discovering now, when we're trying to recruit people from temping agencies, mm. a lot of people just don't have the ability to be able to respond as quickly as is needed or to be be able to act on their own initiative, work things out. Mm. And there's a lot of that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll stay there for now. So in... In terms of bringing people in, then, what what would you think is the best way of, of what's the what's the solution to that recruitment problem in your in your opinion? I'd like to see more people coming in. We're, we're running an apprenticeship scheme, but I haven't seen anybody. Mm. And I'd like to see schools making the opportunity available for children to come in and work when they're doing their work experience. Again, don't really see much of that. We need to be promoting that, mm. getting kids in, getting them to see what it's like, look at the environment. I mean, it's a fabulous environment. And if you're in the right team, mm. I would say I've never worked anywhere better. Mm. Um, so get people in and then promote from within. Teach your people. Yeah. Yeah. And retain them. And retain them, yeah. yeah. Well, if you teach them and if you promote them, you will retain them. Yeah. And you'll also retain all the experience and knowledge that they've got, which yeah. is critical. And you're also giving something back to the employee so they yes. feel that they're getting something from Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And people coming in at the bottom will know that there is a natural progression that does take place. Not that can, but that does. Mm. If yeah. they want it. Of course, not everybody wants that, but as I've found out, <laughs> you know, it isn't necessarily the case that everybody does want to come in and have promotion. I've spoken to a number of people as a union rep who really don't want that. They're happy on the banding they are and they just want to stay doing that. Yeah. It, well, it, do you think it's kind of... Um, like, do you think we already have a social value for ourselves in our minds of, I want to earn X amount, I want to be at this level, have these things, and then I'm happy and I don't really want any more than that? Yeah, it's a tricky one because I can only speak for myself. Mm. I, you know, and especially having, as a union rep, talked to a lot of people at work, I realised the motivation and the self worth and self value mm. and self expectation. I guess is a big one. Um, is different in everybody. For me, yeah, and I'm not there yet, and I'm sixty, so I'm not going to get there. So I shall forever be striving mm. till I'm seventy when my mortgage is paid off. I wanted to be somewhere I could make a difference and I could influence things. Mm. And at the moment, I can only do that through my union work, which is great. But I don't get the opportunity in my day job to do that. Well, you, you're doing it in an abstract sense. I mean, you're, you're working within the NHS, you're working on the admin side, you're, you're responsible for a part of that organisation operating and operating smoothly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the work itself is... Of social value, okay, okay, there's arguments about whether the admin side is being done effectively, but the, you know you could have that argument about any part of social admin at the moment. I mean, yeah, things aren't really running smoothly. Yeah. Um, or they are running very smoothly and exactly as they're supposed to work, <laughs> and we're just seeing the reality of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, people yeah. don't share best experience at work. People yeah. don't do that either because they want to keep what they can do really well to themselves because mm -hmm. either it makes them valuable mm. um, or because it gets them a lot of praise because they can do it or it gives them an opportunity to help others. You know, there's several motivators for that. Yeah. But we don't share it. So you find several teams doing exactly the same piece of work because nobody's saying, actually, this is what we're working on and this is how we're doing it. I've found um, that... Sometimes you'll get with teams that they have a perception of themselves where they think we do this thing really well. Yeah. Um, and because they think they do it really well, they're not really up to criticism or looking to improve it. They just like, we do this really well. And when it's actually examined a lot of the time, it's not done that well. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, okay. So let's go on to the union for a bit because we haven't really had any discussions union wise at the moment so how did you get into the union uh, my grandfather was always a staunch unionist mm -hmm. so I grew up around it mm. I joined 
um, Unison when I went to work at became a union rep and then we actually ran into difficulties with management and ultimately management actually seconded me to the union full time for three months right. towards the end of the negotiations um, so yeah through through family I guess initially but then just because if people are being treated badly mm. somebody has to stand up and say hang on a minute mm. and if I'm expecting somebody to do that and I'm not willing to do it myself, then I don't deserve anybody to stand up for me. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, have, and you've stayed with them since? No, I moved okay. when I went to... Having come from Unison, mm -hmm. I contacted Unison and asked them if they could put me in touch with the rep where I was working and become a rep for the building where I was, which is massive. Mm -hmm. And it took, I would say, about nine months in when I still hadn't got anywhere. Mm. I approached Unite, who put me in touch with their rep that same day. And by that afternoon, I'd transferred over as a rep for Unite. Mm. So you've been with them for, what, a few years? Six years Six or so. Years. And I'm the only Unite rep in the whole building. There are about half a dozen Unison reps. So that was another reason that... Mm. You know, the Unite members also need somebody yeah. in the building. It's not good enough just to have all yeah. unison. Yeah. Um, so do you do you find that rewarding, stressful? Hugely rewarding. Yeah? Hugely rewarding, yeah. Yeah, you can make a difference as and a union. Do you find you get quite a lot of positive feedback from peers for it? Yes, surprisingly. Yeah. And my director at the moment is an ex-union rep. Mm. Um, so she's hugely in favour of unions mm. and I am on a couple of committees which are management and unions. Mm. So it's where we get senior managers and unions working together and actually they work together pretty well. Mm. You know, I've been quite impressed by the fact that it does seem to be an equal footing when you're in the meeting. There's a couple of things that makes you think, yeah, you're trying to slip things out without us approving it. But mm -hmm. I'm in a position where I am able to say yes, that's fine, you get my vote for that to go ahead, or no, and they can't do it without us because yeah. the law requires them to have agreement of the unions. Yeah. So it's in their interest to work with us too. Yeah, and which gives yeah, the best great. results. Yeah, it does, yeah. it does. Um, so, yeah, so when you were seconded then mm. to the union, mm. were, you, were you in, were you sort of repping for them or were you, Working as a full-time officer for the union? Or? I was working as a full-time officer for the union for three months, yeah. We had uh, a huge issue with the interim chief executive wanting to downband all the senior medical secretaries. Right. So knocking them down from a band four, which, let's face it, isn't that great, down to a band three. So... A lot of the women have been there for years and years and years and years. It's such a job that people can move into and never leave. Mm. We're losing seven and a half grand a year. Mm. It's a significant amount of money. Um, and management had said it will save X amount of money. And myself and one of the union rep were seconded over to try and find out other ways of saving the money, mm -hmm. which we did. Yeah. Didn't save the down banding, though. No. You can't win them all. No. Or any. Almost. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but you win some. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, just off the top of your head, would you say that the union work's more rewarding than the paid employment? Yep. yep. Even when you were being paid for doing the union work? Yep. Yeah. Um, do you think you would have a different attitude to that if, like, you're all, like, if you, if you had done a professional qualification, if you were a doctor or a nurse, like, do you think that you'd not necessarily, obviously not be happy with the the politics, small p politics and big p politics around it. Um, but the line of work, you know, being more immediately involved in that hands-on, having a positive effect, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm... Uh... Oh, well, let me put it another way. What... What do you th what what was more rewarding about the union work than the admin work? You know, when when 
you know, you're, you're more likely to affect things at a larger order at your paid employment yes, yeah. um, than you are in the, the union yes. position. Okay, so I guess the main difference is that things happen. And you can see those results. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I ran some workshops for staff at bands seven and below in the north region um, to find out what were they... What was it blocking people? What were the obstacles to getting higher? Yeah. Because seven is like a cut-off point, and yeah. then you become more managerial. Mm. Um, and it was fascinating. And one of the issues was that they weren't getting any training because, well, we can't afford not to have you here because we need you to do X, Y, Z, mm. all those sort of things. Um, we can't send you on a stretch assignment or a secondment because we can't backfill your post. You know, all of these things that are just nonsense, really. So I recommended two changes to the contracts of staff in the North, mm. which were that there would be a ring-fenced budget for admin training, mm. seven and below, which must be used, and that all staff were entitled, if they chose to take it, to a minimum three days training every year, which is not a lot. No. But it's enough to do a couple of courses, a two-day and a one-day or a three day and there are a lot of courses that are that sort of length I looked at the length of the courses that we run and sort of tried to pitch it in such a way that it wouldn't be well we can't give them all a week or mm. and um, both those changes were made to the contracts with a view to rolling it out across NHS England if it's successful so it happened and it all happened very quickly mm. um, you see it you know you see the results do you think a lot of the time it's just you know, not n not so much malice and incompetence, just lack of ideas. No, I think it's red tape. And the fact that none of our systems speak to any other systems. Mm, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you apply for a new position number because you're looking to recruit. Mm. You jump through the hoops and have to get approval from 27 other people. Um, you eventually get that approval you go to put it on the system and the system says that's not a recognised number because the two systems haven't been synced. It's not automatic. So then you go to the second team and say, we need you to upload this. Oh, we're not doing an upload this week. And and then when that gets uploaded and you finally manage to put your position up, then there's another issue that comes up. <laughs> you remember a staff coming in, you try and apply for, they need a laptop, they need a phone. Each of those things goes to different departments, none of whom talk to the other. So mm. accounts are being set up and no laptops delivered or you get a laptop but no accounts. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's just big. It's unwieldy. Monolithic. And there are no interconnect yeah, <laughs> there are no interconnecting links between all of these blocks. Mm. Um so is that because it's a public service and because obviously when you were working in IT, being in the private sector, you didn't encounter those problems. No, we were providing software, so we were the ones going out <laughs> you, saying... You were the ones creating them. We were, yeah. We were the, I, I mean, I did work on uh, one programme that was for hospitals, and we sold it into... But there's never any discussion from whether this will talk to anybody else's systems, mm. or whether, in fact, our system would talk to any of their other systems, and mm. they don't. So then you're paying hand over fist to get other things that you need mm. in order to make things work properly. Nobody has stepped back and done a massive overview. What systems are the, is the NHS using? Which ones are going are being used for the same purpose? Have you done a, an assessment of them to make everybody use the same one? Mm. Buying in bulk, you're going to get it an awful lot, an awful lot cheaper. Mm. In fact, that would be such a coup for any company. It's just... They need to step back properly and start looking at all the little pieces like a big jigsaw and trying to put it together. Mm. And it's a mammoth task and nobody has the time, the money or the inclination to do it. Mm. Because any money we get should be used for patients. But we're wasting billions. But using money for patients is, you know, buying mops and buying cleaning products sure. and buying yeah. buildings. And, and, and if it was also used to buy... <clears throat> a shit hot IT infrastructure mm. they would save so much money and time mm. yeah but that, well I don't really want to go into 
a large broad order discussion about bikes like infrastructure i think there's a lot there um so i'll try and bring it back to the work side of things so from from the it experience what what were the sort of issues there was that just market issues of the way that businesses were rising and falling or being acquired or were there things that were inherent in that kind of sector or what what was that like what what period were you there from so you were working in it so with dot-com bubble yeah bursting in 2000 were you yep. either side of it oh yeah both it? sides of it yeah, yeah i was i i, I learned COBOL at college so obviously yeah 2000 that was big um, yeah, I was in IT from the late 80s. Yeah, so you were coding. So I was coding initially, yeah. Um, and towards the end, training programmers and systems engineers. Mm -hmm. Because I found I loved training, inadvertently. Um, so hugely male-dominated. It would be me and 15 blokes in an IT department. Very cutthroat. Mm -hmm. No way you were going to get the same potential for progression because you were overlooked as a female you were seen as slightly strange you know programmer and even towards the end when i was teaching people would arrive for the coding course obviously 95 percent men mm -hmm. um, and would be looking over my shoulder to see where the teacher was you know it, it didn't change throughout mm -hmm. my time there and i think companies got greedy they were manufacturing things and selling them at ridiculous prices mm -hmm. when it didn't take anything like the resource to develop and code mm -hmm. um, that warranted the amounts they were charging. Slick sales teams who weren't averse to, of course it can do that, of course it can do that, yeah, that'll be fine, mm -hmm. without really having any understanding of the systems at all. Mm -hmm or having coders with them to go through, or, or analysts with them to be able to go through in sales pitches how things really worked, mm -hmm. what could and couldn't be done. Yeah. So mis-selling yeah. um, and, and getting greedy. And then, of course, once you've sold to the local community and local businesses, mm -hmm. you're really lucky if you can expand that much further because every city had software houses doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. And if you were going to buy... You'd buy from somebody local because they were on hand. Mm -hmm. They could get to you to fix things yeah. and do updates. and So, yeah, greed, money. Yeah. And as well, uh, like, it, so much more of it was really outsourced then. Yes. I mean... Yes. M most, com you know, every company's got an IT department now. They didn't really exist. No, much, so no, they didn't. They were very rare. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, like they've kind of realised actually we need this, we need to know how to do this and we need to do it in-house. And we need it we doing can. quicker. Yeah, and we, well, and when we need stuff fixed, we want yeah. it fixed, now. we want to be able yeah. to fix it. Absolutely. If you're outsourcing something, you're reliant on somebody else. You are. Um, so, yeah, so just on the demographics then, so within that, you know, male-dominated um, spectrum, was there a broad age range? Was there a broad education range, socioeconomic background, or was it just, you know, young posh boys? Or... It was young posh boys. Yeah, yeah, ninety percent of the time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you did meet other people. Yeah. Um, Did you meet any old boys who like used to tinker when it was yes. early internet? And, yes, yeah. absolutely. And and they were the people who would be the ones who had the desk in the corner. Yeah, and just had their head down, to. and nobody really spoke to them or yeah, interacted with them yeah. or they were here. Came up you... with an idea that no one listened to. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and people would forget they were there. Yeah, you know, everything would go on around them. They would be like this fixture that was there when you arrived and yeah. there when you left, and never really spoke, mm. but were really, really good at what they did. Usually, um, okay, so yeah, that, that that's brought up an interesting question for me. But like pre yuppie. Did, did that sort of fashionable entrepreneur type exist? Like, because, you know, that, that, I mean, that's the same guy, the guy who's, uh, like, working in IT around about the dot-com bubble, and then yeah. it's like, you know, the guys that are working in the city and the, the guys who are developing apps and the guys who are doing this. And, uh, you know, there's always a sort of trendy image of the young, successful, educated entrepreneur. 
Um, and as far as I can see, I don't know, like to me that goes back to the yuppie. Did that exist? Yeah, no, it didn't really. No, yeah. it really didn't. Um, again, it was money and what was being promoted at the time. Youth. It was loads mm. of money culture. It was Margaret Thatcher. You know, mm. it was get out there. You can be a dot com billionaire. It was mm. obviously huge around that time, and yeah, everybody thought they could. Mm. Um, and no, it wasn't. The only people you had really before that who were in their shiny suits and were the, were the wide boys. You know, mm. they, I guess the uh, the underworld criminals yeah, to a certain yeah. extent, like the craze, you know, and yeah, and, yeah, and spivs, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and then all of a sudden you got the, yeah, dynasty years and the 80s and the women with their wide shoulders and the men either in their tracksuits and bling or in their smart, sharp suits and shiny suits, shiny mm. shoes. It's sort of, it's kind of like a recuperation of um, working class crime. Yeah, 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 it is, it is, yeah. <laughs> it's all right, you're all legit now. Yeah. <laughs> you can destroy anything. Just wear some flashy outfits. That's exactly right. Um, okay, um, so, uh, I mean, has that been your, so has it been admin and IT? Have you worked in yeah. any other sort of? No, areas, no, no, no. I mean, I've done training in both. Yeah. Which I consider to be slightly different. How do you feel about the training side of things? I is that better or worse than the union side? Better or worse than any other part of it? Is it is it something you enjoy? I love it. Yeah, absolutely love it. Mm. To be able to take a room full of people and see so many light bulb moments that go on, mm. and people coming together and speaking up and interacting and being being able to facilitate that and encourage mm. people to join in and. And to be aware and make sure everybody's joining in. And mm. it's a huge, huge feeling of satisfaction when you've had a good training session. Mm. Hugely. It's instant reward again. Yeah. But then you don't, well, I suppose you get to see those uh, sort of instant reactions, but you don't really get to see the, the learning necessarily, the effects of the learning. No, you don't. You no. don't get the, the outcome of that. No, you Does don't. Some people, because, I don't know, I've been on training courses where you know you're like wow that was really good i learned so much and then you go out and you don't use any of it <laughs> ever again not yeah. useful yeah. to you at all what I, I guess to a certain extent and it's the same with my union work i rely on my people skills mm -hmm. and training's enormous for that so i think if you've had somebody in a training session and they've gone away thinking yeah that was good and even though they may not ever look at it again or use it again for a start, you've probably changed their attitude a little towards training mm. and it will make them more likely to go on more training in mm. the hope that they'll have another day where they come out and say, that was really good, I enjoyed that. A positive reinforcement. A positive, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and actually to get people talking and communicating, mm. what I do notice, certainly from where I've done facilitation for new line managers and run a few training sessions, um, you see those people making contacts. The mm. people who you have in your classroom mm. make contacts and you can see relationships developing mm. and you do see those go on. Yeah, even because between you, colleagues who yes. work together but don't work yes. together. It's like they get yeah. to spend some more time together. Exactly, and they're learning a bit about what everybody else does yeah. in the organisation. Yeah. So, you know, that that's also for me. And then when you've got talking. work along that line, it's like, yes. I know someone that does exactly. that. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that in itself is also rewarding because you, you're facilitating people building networks mm -hmm. and creating friendships mm -hmm. and getting colleagues to be colleagues and mm -hmm. not just somebody they happen to sit in the same building with. Yeah, 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 no. Um, so that, I think, leads neatly to education because you, mm -hmm. you studied later in life. Did you yeah. go straight into uni when you were younger? No, no. So you didn't. Didn't, you didn't at all? No, no. I... Um, at 11, was absolutely acing everything. Mm. Um, got 100% for both maths and English in my 11 plus. Mm. Got a scholarship to not the very local girls' high school, but the one in Wakefield. So we were living in Barnsley. Mm. So I got a scholarship to Wakefield, did a year there, absolutely loved it. I was like a sponge for knowledge. Mm. And, I, and still am. I'm a sponge for information that mm. intrigues me or interests mm. me or educates me mm. um, so it wasn't hard to learn and do really well and then we moved to Leeds mm. so I had to change schools although it would have been sensible just to say it's no further 
mm. just get the bus from Leeds to Wakefield instead of Barnsley to Wakefield. But anyway, yeah. and I ended up going to a school that had been a boys' school and a girls' school, and it was the year they mixed, and it was the second year mm. of high school. So trying to fit in mm. was not the easiest. I'd come from oh Wakefield Girls High School mm. to a school that was not rough, but mm. not. That had already bonded in you. Were yeah, into well, yeah, that and the fact that you had the boys and girls mixing for the first time. Yeah, they'd already. They were in their little packs change, and they yeah. were doing their, you know. So it, yeah, it was very hard. And in fact, the way I survived school was through gift of the gab and mm. people skills. I guess again, even mm. then. Um, so I did sell through it, mm. but by getting in with the gang who were perhaps not not the best, the best, you know, <laughs> certainly not academically. Um. But they liked me, so made it easier. I'm just going to pick on you if you're part of the cool gang. You know, mm. That sort of nonsense that goes on at school. Um, home life was absolutely abysmal. Mm. Um, and I applied, when it was coming up to O-levels, I applied to Jacob Kramer Art School, uh, Leeds College of Art and Design now. Yeah, yeah. And they offered me a place. Mm. And my best friend at school, whose home life was equally abysmal, mm was also off to a place. Mm -hmm. So I took Lighter home, I hadn't told mum I'd applied, took it home and said I've been offered a place and she laughed in my face and said don't be ridiculous. So I chose to leave home at 16, but because home life was so bad and the group I was in, you weren't really allowed to get straight A's. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I left school with two O levels in English and English. Yeah. Because one of my huge escapes is reading. Yeah. Always has been, always will be. Love books. Um, so it would, would have been very difficult to fail English, even though I hadn't necessarily been doing the work because I enjoyed reading the set books. You know, yeah. I enjoyed them. Yeah. They were interesting to me. You know, Shakespeare, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. You know, different language. I've got to really think about this. So that thirst for knowledge and learning was, you know, still there despite everything else. So yeah, left with English and English. And then after I'd had the girls, when they started coming home from school with maths that I just didn't recognise, mm. you know, I had a slide rule and a log book and, mm. and they started bringing this maths home and I was thinking, I, can't, I, I don't know what this is, I can't help them. So I went to do an O-level in maths mm. and day one they gave you a pass paper, which was hilarious, I think I must have got about 10% when it came back, mm. um, and they gave you a projected grade of a C so I came out with a with an A mm. and then went on to do economics and um, yeah, pure and applied maths, which was a big mistake. I should have done just pure maths because didn't get it, mm. bombed out of that, failed my economics A level. Mm. Um, so sacked that off for a bit, applied to go to our local college to do a degree in English. Mm -hmm. Didn't even get an interview for that. So then applied to the Open University um, and did psychology. Took the BSc route rather than the BA route. So I was doing a lot more of the science around psychology. So why did you switch from English to psychology? Well, I, I, I assume think... you were doing English because you were still interested in the language. Yeah, and, yeah. Was and like, books. Oh, I was and, good at yeah, this and yeah, this is... Yeah, and it's books, you so, know. So what... Did, well... W was it a vocational thing? No, I've some... never thought about psychology. Um, but I had a friend who... We had children of the same age and she started doing a psychology degree. And because I have that inquiring mind, mm. I would ask her about it a lot, a lot. And she would tell me what she was doing and it sounded fantastic. Mm. So I thought... I'll give that a go. Yeah. And I went for the BSc route because I still believe that it's regarded more highly than a BA mm. because it's considered to be science, science, real subject. Mm. So absolutely. So was that just it. a psychology BSc? Uh, BSc ons right. in psychology. And because you could choose each year mm. what you, the, the module you wanted to do, I was able to spend a whole year doing uh, learning and development again, you know, really piqued my interest in how you teach, how you mm. teach people things. And obviously it went through from children all the way through to actually teaching and learning styles, mm. which was just so fascinating. 
I still think it's the most fascinating subject I've come across yet. Mm. Love it. Absolutely love it. And of course, then you've got a degree, so you can apply to places like... Um, so, it, you know, it opened doors. And I loved every minute of it. And then I went after that. I took a couple of years off and missed it so much. I then did a couple of years of English. Mm. Um, I didn't complete... Because I, I would have had to do one more year to have got my degree, but by that time I'd married again and... I thought, well, I don't need it for anything. It was just, I did it because I wanted to be able to read more critically. Mm. So I didn't want to think, I've started reading this book, I have to finish. God, this book's boring. I've got to finish it. Oh my God, I've only got so far through, I've got to finish it. I wanted to be able to go, actually, no, I'm putting it down. And it's only recently that I've started making that connection that I've always had with music. If I listen to something and don't like it, I turn it off. Mm. So why is a book any different? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well... It I, I totally agree. There's two, but there's the kind of flip side of that argument, isn't it? There's the, the sort of, you know, you have to go through the whole thing to form a whole judgment. And I think that's part of why we get into that kind of, I'm going to slog through this. Mm. Um, but also, you know, when you've done it enough times, you can kind of project, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, you can. Prejudice yeah. is there for a reason yes. sometimes. <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> have a quick shorthand of like I've seen seven of these sort of films. Yes. This may very well yeah. turn out <laughs> to be a complete masterpiece, masterpiece, but I very, very I much like doubt it. it. And I think now, I also I do think, especially the older I'm getting, there is music out there. There are books out there that I will never find that mm. would change my life. <laughs> so I don't want to waste time yeah. listening to pop music mm. or reading trashy magazines when I could be learning and I don't necessarily mean learning as in oh it's an educational book mm. because every book that you enjoy and that's got a bit of depth to it is a learning experience yeah um, okay we're going to bring it back to work <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I'll, I'll go a bit abstract here if you could have a what would be your dream job like, if you could have any job, like, even if it's sitting at home, not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky one because there are so many things that I really like doing. And I'm yeah. not sure you could combine them all in one job. But I mean, not necessarily just the role. I mean, like, in terms of, in terms of the activity of the job. So, the, like, a friend of mine, <laughs> like, his ideal job is sitting down telling people to fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> that, okay, I get that's, that. That's get, the yeah. job he wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, so, I, I mean, it, 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 that's a very neat way of summing up mm. your response to work and what, what you want from mm. a job, I think. You know, most people aren't that honest and realistic about yeah. what they want from a job. It's just like, you know, what do you want from a job? Not too much standing. Yeah. Uh, not being in the uh. rain. <laughs> uh, so I, I mean you know your perfect job could be something like that if, you know something with a bit less sitting down I mean that's been my objective for roles before I, like the last temp role I had it was like this is good because I'm not sat down all yeah. the time yeah yeah well I guess I would want to have a job where I'm still learning mm -hmm. so I do love teaching, mm -hmm. but when I was teaching IT, doing the same course to programmers every week gets a bit repetitive. It's the people that make it interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what I would want to teach, <laughs> but to get interesting people through the door and be able to spend time with them and share learning because mm -hmm. you learn from them, they learn from you. But also something that can make a difference. It's that again, isn't it? I mm -hmm. want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. If I see something's wrong... I want to be able to at least discuss it with somebody mm -hmm. and be in a position to say, I think we should do this. You think we should do that. Actually, yes, you persuaded me. I think that's a good idea. You're still part of something happening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be your idea all the time, but mm -hmm. you do have to get a conversation going and be part of the decision making for me to feel I'm making a difference. I'm having an impact. Okay. that's So this is another sort of workplace um, buzzword. Um engagement i mean like from the, the the shape of our discussion it seems to me that it doesn't matter where you're working you're always engaged with the work yeah um 
which well you say that and say like yeah of course I am but <laughs> it, you could easily not be you know like if you were hanging with the kids from the wrong side of the track like you could be very much of an attitude of like you know very author- anti-authoritarian oh yeah and, yeah like, yeah but I suppose that that <coughs> is it fair to say that that's there but it kind of comes out of let's negotiate rather than you know, like I, I'm taking a position of I'm against you, but I'm going to have, a, but I'm going to discuss it with you mm. rather mm. than I'm against you and we're not talking and you cross this line. Yeah, I... because if I if somebody disagrees fundamentally with what I'm saying, mm. I have to acknowledge that things that I believe are are only my beliefs, and I can't expect anybody else. Mm. To share my beliefs, mm. even if it's somebody who's my twin, mm. my twin sister, their experiences in life are different. Everything is subjective. Mm. You can't be objective. Mm. Um, so, in order to change anything, I'm interested. Why do you feel that way? What is it that makes you feel that way? Mm. I can tell you why I feel the way I do. Mm. I can explain it. I can give you the rationale behind it. I can tell you what I think the benefits are. But I want to know yours. And clearly, you believe them. And I'm, I always come from the position of they genuinely hold their beliefs. Yeah. I just want to know why. Yeah. What motivates that? What encourages it? What feeds it? Yeah. 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 Uh, that's just background noise in, in the house because we're recording in, in the house we've got <coughs> two sick people unfortunately yeah. uh, and that's not counting us two <laughs> so I'll have an excuse to cough now um, yeah so after the degree yeah. did you did, did that provide employability straight away um, yeah, I mean, I was still working in IT, and I went to an organisation. So how did you get into the IT? So you just taught yourself the from from the beginning. Things. No, uh, we had again it was through a friend, somebody I knew, who uh, worked for IBM, mm-hmm. and we used to play bridge together and um, liked a lot of the same sort of puzzles. And he just said to me, "I think you should look at going into IT because I think you'd be, I think you'd." You know, you'd really find it quite easy to be a coder and I think you'd be really successful. Mm. Um, so I went to college uh, when I got knocked back for the English degree. Right. I enrolled and did uh, computer programming. Yeah. So you were kind of determined to do something, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yeah. So that so that got you a job and then that that allowed you to actually do to apply, the study. Yeah. Were yeah. you, were yeah, you yeah, having yeah. to pay for the OU? Uh, yes. Yeah. Or was yeah. it full, full fees? Or? Yeah. 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 Um, but it's I mean, obviously it was a lot cheaper than so. I think I was still paying around seventy pounds a month, and when you consider this is you know I qualified I think in ninety six, so mm. it's mm. quite some time ago. It was a lot of money, but I was working in IT, and you know it was big money. Yeah, not like not huge big money, big but, money, yeah, it but you know it yeah. was I was okay as a single mum yeah. with two kids right. being able to find that money every month to no. fund. Yeah more learning yeah and those wages drove up other wages you know? yes yeah um so how are we doing for time does that move around we've gone 43 minutes and so um is there anything i should touch on no although i think it might be pertinent to the conversation to say that before i did it I've never been able to just sit around. So when the kids were little, I went to playgroup. I trained to be a playgroup leader mm. and took a job as a playgroup leader. Right. Then when they started swimming, because I couldn't sit on the side of the pool with all the other mums, it was always mums, um, talking about how much eggs cost in the supermarket this week, um, I learned to be a swimming teacher. Mm. And then as the kids got better at swimming, I learned to be a coach. So I didn't teach them, but I taught classes alongside them. So I was always bringing in some revenue okay. um, in one way or another. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed singing. I took some singing lessons and I did jingles for the local radio station. So, yeah. you know, again, it wasn't huge money. But I always wanted to be doing yeah. and learning. Yeah. Engaged. Engaged. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um 
Well, I, I mean, you'll have a perspective on this because, you know, you've done training, work, you've worked from the union side, you know, you've, you've got enough work experience. Now, what do you think... I, basically, to have a discussion around engagement, I mean, like, what, what do you think are the issues for people for being engaged with the business? And what do you think are the issues of... Um, for businesses of, of like getting that engagement and because I do uh, you know it, it is like a employment buzzword thing so the, the, there's a part within me that automatically wants to resist it and go no it's all evil but it, you know when you put your sensible head on and like well you're in an organization that's trying to do something and the best way to do that is if we're all on the same page and we're mm. working together, not like in a you know monolithic, mm. mindless you know with with dissent, with ideas, with discussion, mm. but working towards the same goal. Um, I mean, that's sort of a no-brainer to me. Of like, yeah, if I'm in a place, I should be on board with what they're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, but and they should be working towards having me on board and mm. keeping me on mm. board. You mm. know. And part of that, I think, is like for me, is listening to your contributions and, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. what you can add. But yeah. what, what do you think on that front? Well, I think there's been a huge growth in soft skills. Mm. So companies are recognizing the need to get staff to engage mm. and to retain them. Mm. And so they brainstorm. A brainstorming session and they say we could do this we could do that and they introduce things like PDRs professional development reviews uh, one-to-one meetings uh, mentoring schemes even mm. and the ideas behind all of these things are coming from a really good place you know let's get together with our staff twice a year and let's talk about you know, how are they getting on? What's what's the work that they're doing? Is there anything they particularly like to do? Is there anything that they really don't like so much? You know, let's spend that time. Let's listen to them. Let's give them that opportunity to speak and tell us what they think. And let's try and make opportunities available to map out a future for them. Do you think that's driven... Do you think that's imposed in a top-down way? Or do you think it's... Well... Do you think it's something that's demanded from the workforce or...? No, I think it was a managerial idea mm. of a solution, or a, at least the start of a solution yeah. to a problem. I think it was coming from a good place. I think the theory behind it is fantastic, mm. but it doesn't happen. So mm. what you've got now is a situation where every six months you spend a good block of time with your line manager. You do, you send them something, they send you something. It's a two-way street. I haven't had one for 18 months. So then the member of staff is thinking, well, I know you're supposed to do that, but clearly I'm not worth it. You're not that bothered. Mm. And what it's doing is causing people to disengage more mm -hmm. rather than engage. So for me, the problems lie in, we've got all these great ideas and they're not implemented or not implemented correctly. <coughs> <coughs> or... They're all treated as a tick box exercise. We've got to do it. The member of staff submits something that says, I'm really not happy about X, Y, and Z. I think we ought to be looking at one, two, and three. And I'd really like to be involved in whatever it is. Mm. The manager who hasn't really got time for the PDR and really can't be bothered reading through it just goes, yeah, 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 yeah. No feedback, no discussion. What's why? What, what do you think is wrong in this area? Why are you upset about these things? Time isn't made available. Mm. So the staff then think, well, you're not listening to me anyway, so why would I say anything? Mm. I'm going to look for a job somewhere else where they apparently do do that sort of thing. Although, whether they do mm. remains to be seen when you get there, I guess. But I think the idea's great. Carrying them out just doesn't happen. And so then you end up actually achieving exactly the opposite of what you set out to do. Is that... Is that just something that's naturally part of that problem? It, it no, it's the fact that it genuinely isn't seen as. I mean, because something I would say, important. Well, well yeah, yeah, well, I, I would say it's largely a resource issue. Yeah, it is. It because is. If you've got the if you've got the space for it, the space and the resources for it, then 
you you can do it. You can you do can. it properly. And yeah. You can do it appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's kind of, it, it's to be seen to be, isn't it? It's yes, be, it is. It, yeah. It's like, well, we've done this. Yeah. Well, we did this whole exercise. Look, here's our project report on it. And it hasn't made any difference how many people are staying. Well, yeah, what yeah. Has, what has yeah. it changed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was yeah. the follow-up? Yeah. We don't know, and uh, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't part of our brief. No. Yeah. <laughs> you said, you <coughs> said, do this, so we did it. Yeah. So it's yeah. done now. No. Um, yeah, cross yeah. it off your to-do list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think well, I think that drives disengagement. I think, you know, like nothing, nothing puts you off more than a bad experience. And like mm. to me, I'm, I I view jobs very much like relationships because they are relationships. Okay, they're you, it's relationships with a lot of things. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but. You know, you embed resentment against your employer. <laughs> you know, yep, you, totally. You, there are things that you don't say to each other yeah. and that you hold back and opinions that you don't put out into the open. And yeah, then, yeah. like, you know, it can be going really great and, you know, you're both feeling really good for a long time. <laughs> or even interviewing, you like, you go to meet them and you're like, oh, is this, how does this fit me? Yeah. Um, yeah. And depending on your personal circumstances at the time, you're like, but it doesn't matter, I just need... <laughs> So, or uh, the employer who's desperate to get somebody in and yeah, nobody's yeah, yeah, turned up, so... Yeah, yeah. I mean... Yeah, you get the job because you're the only one who gave for the interview. Yeah, and, and then those people start and you're like... And you know that side of it of like, yeah, they've interviewed 12 people and yeah. they were all terrible. Or, or yeah, they they got no one for this job and they've advertised it three times and you're the only person turned up. No wonder you got the job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think we need to be looking at a far younger age and across the spectrum of kids at these are the things you can do. It's like you were saying about engaging is because I had a grandfather who was just fascinating mm. and fascinated by everything and it rubbed off. I don't think hugely. we should have a school that has um, deaths and chairs no. at this point. Like, or, or even subjects. Mm. Like for me it should be you go in and you do a thing. Like you do projects, mm. you you you're gonna build something, you're gonna paint something, you're gonna, yeah. you yeah. you you want to find out about such a such character. Mm. The ideas come from them. You yeah. help them do it. Yeah, you know, like yeah. what do you want to do? Right. Well, we, Let's make I, I want to make a yeah. I want to mm. make a rocket. Okay. Well, we're gonna make the rocket for this kid this week. Mm. So we're all gonna find out how to do that. What are we gonna make it out? Well, where do we get materials from? <coughs> how do those materials come from? It? What's what's the benefit of using it? You know, like the, you 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 learn through doing. That's that's yeah. how you learn in yeah. the real world when you're working. If yeah. you if you're given a piece of work, you you're like, okay, well, I don't know how to do this, so I'm gonna find, out. find out. Yeah, somewhere. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, that's more I, I useful. Just, I just think. Well, it's, we're trained it's... to be told. What we're going to be. Yeah. Well, well, and what to do. Yeah. And, and yeah. what yes. to do next. Yes. It's like, yeah. Here's your social instruction. Stand by yeah. until we need Await you. instruction. <laughs> yeah. 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 <coughs> I think we need to be telling kids they can be anything. You know, there are so many kids who come from houses with not a single book or... I do, but I also mm-hmm. think we need to be telling them that they can't as well. We do. But I th- <laughs> well, I think, I think we need to be saying... You this, need to be realistic. Yeah. Well, you can't be anything. To be saying, these here's, are all the range the of jobs. Yeah. You know, you can be anything from this to this. Not you can be anything, but mm. as children, you know, as the next generation, you can be anything from here to here. Mm. From, and I'm not going to classify because I'm not going to say that's at the bottom of the yeah, yeah. <laughs> chain and that's at the top, but across the board. And kids already, when they're going to school at primary school, know that they fit into this block, socioeconomic, mm. cultural, mm. political backgrounds. Mm. That needs to go. So I've talked to people who have retired. Mm-hmm. Are you looking forward to retirement? Or are you kind of dreading it? Um, or a bit of both? Neither. Neither, neither I would say, because um, I won't have the opportunity to retire for another 10 years anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd like to think that in that time I could make a difference somewhere, doing something, you know, and if that's where I end up staying. I would welcome the opportunity to sort of read more (coughs) 
and have days when I'm not doing things. I wouldn't want to not be doing anything anyway. So there would be classes I could go to that I can't go to now. If I get a Labour government, I'll be able to go and get my PhD and not have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So there's all those. I want to carry on learning. I want to carry on living. I don't. It depends how you define retirement. And I know some people define it as I've stopped now. I'm going to sit with my slippers and my Sunday newspaper. And that's me done. So, um, I mean, you've. When, when you have the kids, mm. there must have been points where you couldn't work. During that, yeah. But I would just so I would assume that you were working the whole rest of the time. Yes. So. And even when they were little, because I did the training to do things alongside them, even when I sort of couldn't work because I didn't have the opportunity because I had them, I was still doing things alongside their lessons and stuff. It's not. I need to get up and I need to go to work or I should get up and I should go to work or I should be doing something. It's the fact that... This is just going to sound so cheesy. It's fine. It's the fact that you get up every day and you don't know what that day is going to bring. Mm. And I want to make opportunities for things to happen. Mm. And I might learn something amazing. I might hear something fantastic. Mm. So it's about wanting to get up and go out and do... And that's not to say that when I'm not working, I might not spend a week, two weeks at home and not go out and do stuff. Mm. But I'm still reading or I'm listening to music or I'm looking for new music. or It's about just having that inquiring mind. Mm. So, Curiosity. Yeah, I need to continue. I'm curious. I want to know as much as I can. Yeah. Hello, it is I, Latrine. At the moment, I'm trying to just get out what I've recorded so far. I already have at least one interview I can't publish and expect to record more of the same. I'll probably stitch together a collage episode with those safe bits, uh, with, with the safe bits of those episodes in the future. At least one episode already has bonus material, which will be going up onto the Patreon site. Uh, some of the interviews are still being cleared. I want to get out what I can as soon as possible. Uh, now. I don't just want these to be adverts or unknown employees. I want job seekers, housewives, prisoners, homeless people, students, all people. The point is to make listeners consider their own view of what work is, has been, can be, and ideally what it should be. Now, given that we are going through Brexit, climate collapse, global limits of productivity and profit, and now a global pandemic, it seems to me to be more timely than ever for us to be thinking about what work can be, who it is for, why we do it, and how it should be performed, and if and how it should be remunerated. I'm certainly not going to make any predictions about the future at such an uncertain time, but I do know that current events can't help but bleed into what I'm trying to do here. So then, if you are in Leeds and you have an opinion on work, whether you're employed or not, I am interested in your view. I don't want this show to be about me, about events or about particular perspectives. I want to capture a snapshot of my city at a particular time. Not an image of how we would like to be seen, but a collage of how we actually are. So, like, share, subscribe, pay on Patreon, donate on Ko-fi, socialise safely, don't hoard, help, look after each other. And I shall see you, well, I shall speak to you <laughs> on the next episode. Thank you.